In this video I want to share with you one of the main reasons most chess players are losing their games, not only that, but on the example of my own tournament game, I want to help you to deal with it and improve your chess level. So, let's get started. Hi guys and welcome to the journey to Grandmaster and I consider the main reason why most chess players are losing their games is because they are not really taking proper lessons from their past games, from, from their tournament games, from their online games and I consider that the uh, most important and useful skill you can acquire is to analyze your own games properly and well taking lessons out of it and not repeating the same mistakes again and again and also understanding the chess better because well, you have put so much uh, of your energy, of your thoughts into the game uh, and now you, you should just check afterwards what, uh, which of the thoughts were the correct one, which were not and well, that's the most one most important thing you can do. And today I want to share with you one of the tournament games I have played recently. I want to analyze it together with you and show you my whole decision-making process throughout the game. I hope it's gonna be very instructive for you. So let's get started. I played this game as white against Ugo Pellegrin from Spain and well, uh, let's let's see what happened here. I played d4, knight f6. I'm not gonna really talk a lot about the opening because it's not really about the concrete opening here, it's rather about the whole analysis process, so let's go. It was yeah some kind of a King's Indian defense with this uh, double fianchetto from the black side and well I clearly saw that it was my opponent's preparation so I tried to somehow um, deviate from the main lines he has prepared so that is why I played this a4 line which is objectively probably not that great but my main goal was to make sure that we are uh, not like my opponent is not still in his book he played a5 just I guess to make sure that the position still uh, stays uh, in line with his preparation now I played b3 which I normally play here in the king's Indian he played castles, bishop to b2, d6, and at some point I thought, well, those pawns are looking weird here, creating a lot of uh, weaknesses along the light square, so I have to use it. That is why I played c4 and d5 here. Now, my light squares are beautiful, I have a lot of targets to attack, but my problem is, of course, my dark squares, because those are incredibly weak, this pawn on b3 is potentially a huge weakness, so there are some drawbacks here. He played e5 immediately and this is one of the first critical mo moments in the game because initially when I played the move c4 and d5 I was going to take on a6 but then I started to uh, calculate the variations more properly and yeah I somehow came to conclusions that I don't want to do it but it was actually objectively the best move in the position so let's go through it together. What I have calculated was takes takes 94 now, with a double attack, I'm attacking this bishop on b7, as well as knight, uh, the knight attacks the pawn on a6. So, bishop takes, because if you defend the pawn on e6, obviously I just win the bishop, so you have, and you don't have any way to defend both of them. I mean, you can play knight c5, which defends both of them, but I'm gonna take this guy first, and then you have to take back, and then I'm winning this exchange here. So, bishop takes g2 is pretty much the only move, and now, well, if I take just back, then I don't really have anything, he has a very good position, this f-file, everything is great, so the key move is here, of course, knight takes e6 in between, attacking the queen, so he doesn't have any time for bishop takes f1, queen goes to e7, now attacking the knight, so once again I can't really take this bishop, the knight goes to f8, uh, at, um, uh, winning the rook, he wins the rook himself too, bishop takes f1, now I'm taking this knight and I came to this pos position in my calculations uh, through the game before I played the move d5 and I thought somehow that I'm bad here after knight uh, takes d7 and now my bishop is hanging and uh, this bishop is attacking the e2 pawn so if I take the bishop for example he just takes here with the tempo and then he takes uh, my bishop back and I don't really have anything here. But what I missed is, since I am taking here this, uh, this rook on f8, it's gone, 
uh, it's off the board. Now this rook on a8 is not protected, and that is why this position is completely winning for white. Uh, for white, think, uh, thanks to this queen d5 check attacking the rook on a8, and of course, yeah, white is just completely crushing. So this whole knight takes d7 back move is uh, not possible for black and. Yeah, unfortunately, in my variations, this rook was still on f8 when defending this, uh, this rook, and that is why I have missed this chance. Objectively, the best move for black here is bishop takes e2 with the tempo, but now I have knight takes f6 check. Now, bishop takes f6 is the only move. Now, if I take on f6, it's actually not that great because he takes back and attacks my rook. But once again, I have this 25 check, and once again, the rook is unprotected. So here after king g7, well, if I take here, it's not such a great move because now I have uh, a lot of difficulties because my pieces are still not developed <coughs> properly and my king is kind of in trouble. So he goes queen g5 and then queen goes to c1. That is not that great. But instead, I can just play knight c3. Remember that development is the most important thing in the opening and, well, it's not the opening anymore, but finally I'm about to finish my development. I want to play rook e1 and then, for example, rook e8, rook e1, and then all of my pieces are finally developed and actually this position is much better for white. Even though the material is equal, but white is much more active and this bishop is in trouble. So. I should have played that actually, but because of my fears, because I felt that this variation doesn't work, I ended up not taking the pawn. I spent so much time here, so yeah, my lesson from this game is that I need to be more, um, more confident in my own calculations. I really need to rely on my intuition, because the, intu the intuition said you have to take on a6, there is something there in the end of the day that the position should be good for white. But when I was just calculating the whole line um, through, because, well, in such an important moment, you can't just completely rely uh, solely on your intuition. The chances are that you're going to miss some tactics and lose the game. So I tried to calculate uh, my best, but, well, it turns out I failed to do that, and that is why I didn't took it. I played knight e1, which is, of course, a much more passive move. I have some positional ideas here, but, well, d takes e was definitely the best move here. I played knight c5, and I immediately go knight d3. He goes knight uh, d7, and also opens this f-pawn. So I thought, well, if I do nothing, then he's just going forward, so I have to be active immediately now. So I played this move f4. He played e4, now opening the whole diagonal. Obviously, my bishop is hanging here, so I took this guy, and then I thought, well, those knights are both basically fighting for this c5 square. And so, I don't really need to exchange it, because then this knight is beautiful, and, well, I don't really have anything here. Knight c3, for example, he goes f5, <coughs> and, well, I don't really have any good prospects. So, I played knight e1 instead, and we got basically the same position, but here I have an additional knight. And I thought it's a great thing for me, because it has some very interesting ideas. And he still has uh, those both knights fighting for the same uh, square on c5. He can't put both of his knights on c5. So that is why I thought, well, it, this variation should be better. But overall, of course, um, black has achieved a lot here, uh, having uh, uh, a lot of squares under control. So I wasn't really uh, happy with the, with the opening here. I should have taken there on the sixes, as you remember, that was my best chance. But still, I tried to remaneuver now my knights, and I have a big problem with this b3 pawn, obviously. If my pawn was still on a2, it would be much better for me, because I would never have this weakness, and now it's a weakness for the entire game, basically. I went knight b5, inviting now the move knight takes b3, because, well, my rook is hanging here, due to my poor development, this knight is blocking my rook. So if I take, then queen takes a1. But yeah, somehow I thought that I can just play rook a3 or rook to b1. Rook a3 is also defending the pawn. And then I take the pawn on c7 uh, back, so now the material is equal, and I have some targets to attack, so I was pretty satisfied with this line. And the engine suggests for black to do it, although my opponent didn't play knight takes b3, Perhaps he had uh, the same thoughts as I did. He played knight a6 uh, instead. I wasn't really expecting that. I think that it's a pretty passive move. A move backwards, of course, you have space 
uh, you have time here as black to uh, remaneuver your pieces, but yeah, somehow it felt a little bit too slow. I went knight c2, continuing my plan. And the other knight went back, and yeah, it makes some sense if this knight might come to b4, but I thought, well, you can do whatever you want, you can place both of your knights there, but it stands great, but what does it do? I mean, it doesn't really attack anything. My knight went to d4, you can, I mean, after you, he played rook f7, and afterwards you can place your knight on b4, and seemingly it looks great, but it really creates no threats, and I wasn't worried about it at all, to be honest. So I played the move g4 here. Actually, I thought that it's a pretty clever move here, because if he takes, I go f5, I'm threatening knight d6, I'm um, putting some pressure on this pawn on uh, e4, and I'm getting a lot of space, and my bishop is finally active, so yeah, I was happy to, to get this position. Although the engine says, well, I'm just stupid, it's much better for black, and actually g4 is a blunder, basically. So my idea was that if he plays queen g5, I have knight to e6, with a fork here, so he must take change. And afterwards, I have this beautiful pawn chain here. And even though I'm a pawn down, this pawn is weak, this bishop is just horrible forever. And yeah, I was happy with it. But the problem is now this queen goes not to g5, but to e5. And if I do the same thing, then in the end of the day, this queen is great on e5. He plays rook f8, activating another piece, and once the queen moves away, he plays c6. And now the problem is I'm not capable of maintaining this whole beautiful pawn chain. And once, well, he manages to exchange something, then my pawn on e6 is weak and I don't have anything anymore, and this position is just bad for white. But fortunately for me, he didn't really find this idea, queen e5, or maybe he's, he's thought it's not so great for black. He was scared of this knight e6 uh, check, which really seems to, to be very scary, because, well, if white gets, uh, gets all of those pawns and is not losing immediately, seems like it's just a dream case scenario. So he played bishop f8. Now I took this pawn on f5 and then took this bishop. And at first, well, it seemed like a very silly decision, because my bishop is very poor, and I'm exchanging my knight for a bishop, and you remember that in the open positions, the bishops are stronger than the knights, but in the closed one, in the positions when you don't have any real open files or open diagonals, the bishops are stupid and the knights can remaneuver itself to different squares and the knights are stronger. So uh, that was my first impression, but then the important detail here is that this pawn on f5, well, if you take with the queen, then this pawn on e4 is the target and this bishop has something to do. And if this pawn takes, which happened in the game, then my bishop has some potential to attack this pawn. And well, there are no pawns to defend the f5 pawn. Uh, oops. And yeah, there are no pawn, uh, pawns to defend the f5 pawn. And I put a lot of pressure on his pawns. And that is creating a difficulty for him. I played knight d4 here, immediately attacking this pawn. He played queen h4, trying to be active, I suppose, but I really didn't like this move during the game and the engine confirms it's not the right one. The right thing was to continue the development. I always tell you in my videos that the development is the most important thing in the opening. You need to develop all of your pieces as fast as possible and as active as possible. Ideally, you should make, make just one move with one piece and then you are going to develop your pieces the fastest way. And here, rook g8, was the move to develop the last piece into the game and then black would be just great. But queen h4 is actually a very bad move because it's not developing anything and also it's allowing me to activate my queen here, offering the queen's exchange. I was very happy to exchange the queens here because from a positional point of view, my position is much better here. I have some targets to attack. Of course, I have this weakness, but this knight on d4 is just beautiful. It defends everything, it attacks everything, it has so many potential ideas. This bishop will always have a good job to do. And then I can, yeah, maybe without the queens on the board, let's just swipe it off. Maybe this king go to e3, this bishop goes to h3, and the rooks will occupy the open g file. And the problem for black is that they can't really fight for the g-file because this f5 pawn is very very weak. And those knights, once again, it would be a pair of beautiful knights standing here and completely useless, without any single idea. 
So that is why I offered the Queen's Exchange, he went back, but th that means that I win some time here. There are a few interesting moves, Queen c3 and Queen g3. I went Queen g3, check, because I thought if I go Queen c3 uh, immediately, he has this move, Rook f6, and then King goes to f7, and then he doubles the Rooks on the g-file, or this Rook moves to h6, somehow he is suddenly pretty active. So I played Queen g3 first, now anticipating King h8, and then I go Queen c3. Three. And then there is no way to play rook f6 because, well, this rook would be just a target here. It's not protected by the king. The king can go to h8 and also the rook will be pinned. And so, otherwise, he has to play rook g7. But once again, it's not that uh, difficult for me to deal with those rooks because I can always pin it. So that, that is what I did. And here, instead of king h8, he played king f8. But now you can see the difference between uh, the developing move and making the move with the same piece. He made a lot of moves with the queen, and now the rook is still here, there on a8, doing completely nothing, and he needed to play king f8, blocking his own rook. Now he needs to spend another two tempi to develop it. And if the rook would be already on g8, he would just happily play king f8, and all of his pieces would be active. So the difference is huge. Always remember to activate your pieces as fast as possible and as active as possible. So I played king h1. I'm just sidestepping all of the potential issues with the g file. And of course, uh, eventually I want to bring my uh, rooks to this open file and attack the f5 pawn. Yeah, so I played uh, rook g1. It's not simple to put the rooks on g-file in the first place because it's not protected. He could have played rook g7 now, but then this uh, f5 pawn is weak. I can just play queen h3, offering the queen's exchange and once again attacking this uh, pawn on f5. And now, yeah, he can bring the rooks to the g-file, so he played rook f8. I played bishop h3. You could notice that my every move is very active. I make sure made sure that my king is safe. I uh, control control now the g file and also I attack this f5 pawn with both of my minor pieces. So basically, those knights are still incredibly useful, use, useless, and it's all about white white attacking pieces. King went to d8, and now. I immediately found the right idea for me, tried to pause the video for a second and find the best move for white. Okay, so the right idea here is queen to g5, giving a check and forcing black to trade the queens. The point is, the end game is so much better for white for all of the reasons I have already mentioned before. A clear target to attack, much more active pieces, open g-files, uh, G file and yeah, just a very beautiful position. But somehow I was kind of in the time trouble by this point. Remember that I have spent a lot of time in the beginning, so it still was very, very tricky and I ended up almost not really winning this game. So let's see how it happened. First, it, it all was great. I have activated all of my pieces. And here he played C6 trying to get some counterplay, because remember, if you are staying passive and you do nothing, you are always gonna lose without any chances at all. So you always should try to create some counterplay, some counter threats. So he is attacking here my pawn center, I can't really allow him to take it twice. So I took it, and then I haven't really found the right way. I played bishop takes f5, I have calculated a lot of lines and I hoped it works for me, and it does but, well, it made the position more difficult than it could have been if I would have just taken with the rook. Because, well, this rook on g5 is not really that uh, needed for me. And I could exchange a pair of rooks and compare it to the variation in the game. Knight xc6, knight to b5, check. Now he can't really defend this pawn because king d7, I have a, a discover attack and I just win the game. So the king should go back. And then, well, this pawn is so weak, I can play rook to d5, I can play rook to h5. I mean, this position is just beautiful. Rook d5, for example, the most obvious move. Attacking this pawn, threatening to win a knight, and the game is practically over. But instead, I played bishop takes f5, leaving both of those rooks very active here. Objectively, almost just as good, but practically, it made the situation much more difficult for me. Here's the same line, and I just took on d6, 
but the problem is somehow my pieces are a little bit not that solid anymore and yeah that is why it's like a little bit scary here i played rook g8 for a moment i thought i blundered something it but no uh, i blundered something here but no i'm i'm still completely fine everything is protected so he can take the knight because the rook is hanging and if you take here then you don't really have any moves uh, with the king to escape the check king a7 for example i always have knight b5 and then my bishop is uh, can be saved and the game is completely winning actually it's even just checkmate probably okay so uh, he can do that he played knight d4 uh, instead trying to be as active as he can I took the h7 pawn, but once again, somehow the position is unstable and somehow these knights uh, finally are active, he has some counterplay and yeah, all of that was not needed. I just thought that I get this two pawns advantage here and that should be enough in every case to win the game, but while well, the engine says it's almost equal now, I have lost almost all of my advantage because back here, if I have taken with the rook, it was like plus five, uh, four and a half and almost no ideas for black, but now suddenly he has a lot of opportunities to fight, at least for a draw. He played knight d3, which is objectively not that great. I use this chance to, to uh, pin his knight along the f-file, and of course I want to exchange some pieces here, because remember, if you have the material advantage, it's always great for you to exchange the pieces. Because the more pieces you exchange, the simpler it gets for you to convert your advantage into a full point. Rook f7, knight g5, and now I immediately use this chance to eliminate one of the knights. Remember, I was in time trouble, and if you don't have any time, those, those knights are very, very tricky, uh, creating a great number of threats for you, so it's much simpler when you only need to fight against one, uh, one knight. And here I played this move, rook to f7, exchanging the rooks uh, as well, because, well, I remember that with the rooks on the board, the chances to make a draw is always higher, so I wanted to get to the knight's end game, and I thought, well, thanks to this passer, it should always be winning for me, but actually it made my task much more difficult, and at some point it once again was a draw. So the right idea was to play h5. I was worried about this, this big knight and pawn, but actually I have a check here, and then the king goes somewhere, rook to g7, and now I'm just ready to push this pawn all the way to h7 and promote it to the queen. Yeah, but somehow I was worried about some uh, threats for the king, I don't know, without the time you're always more scary than it's needed. And so I played rook f7 trying to say that, well, now I can never get into any trouble, and it's only a question of me converting the advantage. But it wasn't that simple, like the engine says, well, the position is completely winning, no questions about that, and I also thought so, but reality is that it was more complicated. So still here I'm doing all of the right moves, I'm centralizing my pieces, now this pawn is still there to deflect uh, the black skin, and while the king is busy uh, taking this pawn, my king should go here and take those pawns and just win the game, that was my plan. That actually didn't work that well because this knight suddenly went to b4 first i went to e5 the knight d3 check and the knight wants to go to b2 attacking all of the pawns and if i go to d uh, to d5 he also has uh, the same knight b2 idea now i can defend it but the problem is i can't move any of my pieces anymore the skin just goes for this pawn and I can't really do anything, because if I go to c6, attacking the p6 pawn, he just takes on c4, and if I take, if I move my knight somewhere, he takes my pawn on a4, so basically I'm paralyzed and the position is not winning anymore. So the right way to continue here was king to f5, and just forget about all of those pawns completely, because if the knight goes here, trying to attack the pawn, then I'm just promoting my pawn, and I'm much faster, of course, this knight is not in time to somehow stop the pawn, because h6, now, if you take the pawn, it's already h7, so you must put your king closer, but then I can just move my king towards the pawn, and once again, you can take any of the pawns, but h7, knight e5, now king back, the knight can, can, can go back, but the problem is this pawn is so strong that it's always winning, it's yeah actually not that difficult, the knight is coming, and then uh, this knight is going to be lost. But, 
yeah, I somehow didn't believe in this pawn and went for a different variation here. Instead of knight f5, I played the move king to d4 back. And after knight b2, I had this king c3 idea in mind. And I kind of want to, um, to catch this knight, to win it. So I played here king b3, and of course white can't play uh, knight c5 as a pawn end game. It's always winning, I'm just taking both of those pawns, while this king runs to uh, grab the h5 pawn. But he has a move b5, takes a knight b6, and now this knight is relatively uh, secure here, and there was a pretty clear plan for me to win the position uh, fast here. I haven't, like, I thought about it during the game, but I have went for another one, and then I actually blundered all of my advantage. So try to pause this video for a second and try to find the winning idea here. So the plan here is to relocate this knight all the way to a4, pushing the knight back and blocking this pawn, and then the king goes to the center while black skin is taking this pawn, and then attacking this knight, the knight has, go, uh, has to go away, and then the pawn is promoting. Somehow I thought it's very important for me to win the a5 pawn instead of just blocking it, and that's why I decided to go not to a4, but to c4. I thought, well, it's the same, but I also attack the pawn. In fact, it's not, and after knight d2, like, after knight c3, king f6, and king f, uh, and knight f4, it's plus 10 for white here, uh, like, the position is completely winning, no chance for black to fight. Like I said, when the knight goes to d7, just king c4, king d5, king d6, and then the pawn goes forward. But after knight d2, king f6, and knight c4, the position is a draw. It's just no advantage for, at all for white, and yeah, it's just incredible how difficult end games are sometimes. And the point is that now uh, black uses this pawn to deflect uh, uh, white from, from his ideas, from my ideas, and this knight goes to in d7, and they have to spend more time to, to take this pawn, and my king is very passive here, instead of being in the center, it's here on the a-file, not helping me to promote my pawn. And that is why black has enough time to take this pawn and go back all the way here and uh, stop this pawn. Let's see. I played knight, uh, king to a5, of course you understand that the main problem for me is I can't really push my pawn, he's gonna sacrifice it and it's gonna be a draw immediately, so my only chance is to um, try to deflect this knight from uh, those uh, squares, from b6, b7 and b8, uh, step by step, and then promoting my pawn. So that is what I tried to do, but the problem is the knights are always very tricky and the knights are all, always finding the squares. For example, here, I, uh, the knight to d6 is a huge threat, as it's an immediate draw, I can't play king c4, I must uh, go back with my knight to make sure that I have this b6 opportunity. Now I played it, king went to b5, and the knight a5, now covering all of the squares, so objectively the position is a dead draw, no problem for the stockfish, but practically in a real game, if you were uh, in the black shoes, it's very, very difficult, very unpleasant to play because, well, I'm creating some threads with my every move and you always need to find this way to make a draw. So, king, king went to a7, king to c8. Now, covering this b7 square, it's not possible for me to play b7. But I continue, I play <coughs> king a8 here. Now, the knight can never move because of b7, so the king has to move. I played king b8. Now, if you move your king away, the king can go to uh, c8, uh, and in case of uh, king to c5, I was going to play king to uh, c some, but maybe, no, maybe not in this line, because here he has 96. It's all very tricky, but my point was to push the king uh, out of this uh, good squares here and try to use it. He played knight e6 instead, now knight b7, like I said, I'm trying to be as, as tricky as I can. I had literally no time, we had 30 seconds increment, but yeah, at some point I had just one second left on the clock, so I needed to be uh, as creative as I can to make it more difficult for him. So I played here back, knight a5, and now king a8. So somehow, if you go back to c8, which he did, now it's the same position, but 
now it's my move. And I use it to remaneuver my knight somehow and well, try to create new threats for him. King went to d7, now uh, well, kind of threatening the move king to c6. So I played knight e4, nothing special, but once again, with my every move, I try to create some new threats for him. Here he played knight f7, because it's not that simple to make a move. Like here, knight f7 is the only move not to lose. This position is incredibly tricky. If you play king d6, you immediately lose after uh, king c8. Yeah, that's the variation I was keeping in mind last time. So king c5, now I play king c7 and there is no knight e6. And if you take the knight, I take your knight and then this pawn is going to be promoted. So the only move not to lose here is knight to f7. I went knight to f3, remaneuvering my knight, king to c6. Now I can't push the pawn because then after knight d6 I'm just losing it. So king went to a7, knight goes to d6 and now king a6 because well he's threatening knight c8 so king a6 is the only way to continue the game. He played king d5 and now this knight is paralyzed, it can't move anywhere because I move to b7 and I need once again to remaneuver my knight somehow. I wanted to go to f7 to sacrifice my knight and then my pawn would be promoted. So that's what I did. He went to e7 and uh, to e4, sorry. And once again, I can't play b7 because of knight c5 fork. So I played uh, king a7. He played knight c5, stopping my pawn. And now once again, I tried to remaneuver my knight to sacrifice it. And let's see what happened here. King went to a8. Uh, just giving the opportunity to him to make a mistake and he still can't really uh, do anything, this knight can't move because he must guard this key b7 square. And according to the engine, his uh, king to d6 move is losing the game now. It's a draw after king to c8, which is not that obvious because now I can still go knight to b3, but well, there is knight b7 and apparently it saves the game. Instead, he played the move king to d6. And now there is only one winning move for white. Try to pause the video and find it. Yeah, okay. Now it's the same knight b3 idea. The point is we are sacrificing the knight and he can't uh, take it. But he played uh, king to c6 and I can't take the knight because he's taking the pawn and it's a draw. So king a7 is the only move. And now the knight can't go to b7. That's the main problem for black because then Knight to d4, king has to go somewhere and then I take the knight and win the game. And of course, obviously, you can't still take the... Like, if the king would be on any other square except for c6, you could take uh, on b3. Let me make it on the board uh, happening. Like here, you can take... Oops. No. Uh, he, here you can take on b3 if the king is not on c6 but on d6 because after b7 you have knight d4 idea and no wait <laughs> d6 is actually a bad square because I promote now with a check but you get my point if the king would be on d7 for example you play knight d7 then b8 queen and knight c6 fork and uh, black is surviving but here with the king on c6 you actually can't take the knight because I just play b7 and promote and you don't have this knight c6 check in the end of the day. So he played knight to d7 attacking my pawn, I played b7 and now threatening b8. Uh, so this knight can never go anywhere from here. And his idea was to say, okay, my knight is stayed in here, you can never um, go here with your king because, well, all of the squares are covered and to go this way is just too far. And my king is gonna make sure that the knight is not going anywhere near this knight. But actually, it's not really possible. And my idea was to remaneuver the knight all the way to f8 somewhere, or f6, to attack this knight, to deflect it, and then promote the pawn. So that's what I started to do. I went here to h7 initially, trying to uh, sacrifice my knight, but suddenly king is 7 and I don't have such an opportunity. But then I found the right idea after a few moves repetition because I don't I didn't have any time I was just living on this 30 seconds increment it was a classical chess uh, game knight f4 check here that is the winning idea and the point is I am willing to sacrifice my knight either on c5 or on f6 and there is no way for black to cover both of those squares with a king he went to e7 covering the f6 but now knight c5 
And if you take, of course, I promote the queen and the queen against the knight is a pretty easy uh, victory for white. He played knight e5. The last trick, because once again I can't promote my uh, pawn into the queen because of uh, knight c6 fork. So I played king to b6, and here he resigned because, well, this square is covered, you can give the last check, but then the king goes to c7, and next move the pawn is going to be promoted, and of course white wins here. So, a very long game, but I hope it was very instructive for you, especially the end game, because yeah, as you see those night end games are very tricky. And the point here, the main lesson I want you to learn from it, it doesn't really matter how the objective uh, evaluation of the position is. What matters is that you constantly put some pressure on your opponent, and that is how you win the, the games. You, you constantly create those threats, you constantly uh, make it difficult for your opponent to handle all of the threats, and eventually uh, the chances is high uh, that your opponent is gonna collapse. So, hit the like button if you enjoyed this video, and uh, even more importantly, it, if it was helpful for you, I'm very happy to be of service to you, and consider subscribing, because even more educational videos are coming in the nearest future, and see you in the next videos.